Let's talk about IVF step by step. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor. And I talk about how to help people get pregnant every single day. If you want to support my mission of fertility education and helping people have the family of their dreams, I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel and follow along. Today, I'm going to be breaking down IVF step-by-step step, what I want you to know. IVF can be very overwhelming, and I think sometimes we go into it not understanding what is happening, and that leads us to not understand when we're getting the right care or what questions we should ask. I have other videos on IVF talking about tips and tricks and things you should know, but this is just a step-by-step -step breakdown. So the first thing to understand is that IVF is in vitro fertilization. This means that egg and sperm are going to be fertilized outside the body or in the lab typically. There's different versions of IVF, meaning you can do a minimal stimulation, you can do something called InvoCell, there's conventional fertilization, there is ICSI. But overall, what is always required is getting eggs to grow, taking them out of the body, and then growing embryos somewhere that is not inside the uterus and the fallopian tubes. Importantly, in order to understand IVF, you have to understand that every month your body actually releases more than just one egg. An analogy that I like to use is if you imagine inside your ovary is a vault where all your eggs are kept, at the start of a month, a group of eggs comes out of the vault. The brain typically sends out FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, a well-named hormone which works to stimulate one follicle to grow. Each egg grows inside a small fluid-filled structure called a follicle, so that's why FSH is well-named. When this follicle grows, that's the one that's going to make estrogen and mature and ovulate, and the rest of them are going to die. So when we do IVF, what we are trying to do, put it really simply, is get all of the eggs that are outside the vault in that one month to grow. We can't tap into the vault. You're not going to run out of eggs any faster or slower because you do the process. We're just trying to get one month's group all to grow forward. Now, maybe not surprisingly, your body doesn't want this to happen because if you have 20 eggs coming out of the vault, your body does not want to have 20 babies at one time. And typically the communication between the brain and the ovary is the way that we prevent this from happening. So in order to do this, we have to override this normal system. And this is considered your protocol. Before a protocol should be given to you, you need to have an assessment of your ovarian reserve. Ovarian reserve is the test to tell us how many eggs are outside that vault, and it typically includes number one, an ultrasound to count the follicles, that's called an antral follicle count, and number two, a blood test called AMH or anti-mullerian hormone. These tests are gonna tell your doctor how many eggs may be expected, and that is going to help your team choose the protocol. The protocol is a combination of suppression and stimulation medications that are used in order to get the eggs to grow. The suppression can vary, Lupron, birth control pills, ovulation blockers, estrogens, progesterones, testosterones, or combinations of the above. And some people don't suppress at all. You just start with your period. I'm a fan of suppressing because I think it synchronizes up the cohort better. And it helps us override that normal brain ovary communication, which just wants one egg to grow. So if you're going to do suppression, it's typically from about two to four weeks before you start the second part, which is the stimulation. The stimulation is the part where you're actually taking FSH hormone shots to get the eggs to grow. Same FSH that your pituitary gland would normally make, just now you're giving it to yourself in a much higher dose than what would normally happen. During this two week period of stimulation, you're gonna be coming in for monitoring visits. These are visits where you come in for an ultrasound and for blood work so we can measure the follicles, check your estrogen, make changes, and we're trying to gauge when your eggs are going to be the most mature. Eggs can be over mature and under mature. It is very sensitive to each person. Everybody has a very unique ratio of maturity. So your doctor, your team is trying to decide when will your eggs be the most mature. So, so far we have before IVF, you're going to you know, have a class, get your meds ordered, have a testing of your ovarian reserve and get things started. Then you'll lead into this calendar portion, which will be maybe suppression and then stimulation. Before the stimulation starts, you have a baseline ultrasound to make sure everything's good to go. The ovary should not be doing anything at that appointment. Then you start the stimulation and you come in for those monitoring visits typically every two to three days. When the eggs get to a place that we think they're mature, you're then going to use a trigger shot and the egg retrieval will be two days later. The egg retrieval is the most invasive part of this process. It's still a minimally invasive procedure, but it's a procedure and no procedure is without risk. 
This procedure is done under anesthesia, so you get an IV anesthesia. It's medication to put you to sleep and relax you so you do not remember, but you're still breathing on your own, so overall low risk. And then a needle, pretty big needle, is placed attached to the vaginal ultrasound and placed through the sidewall of the vagina, the top of the vagina, to get into the ovaries. And then this needle goes into each follicle and you drain out the follicular fluid. This is actually attached to suction. And so while the machine is on suction, it's providing a little bit of suction in order to get those follicles to collapse. What's happening then is that the eggs are going to be identified in the lab. And what happens next all depends on exactly what you're doing. For the most part, we're going to have a sperm sample the same day, and then eggs and sperm are going to be combined. There's two different types of fertilization. You have conventional fertilization, and you have something called ICSI, or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Conventional fertilization is where you take a Petri dish, you just put sperm and egg in the dish, and then you incubate it overnight, and you open it to see how many eggs are fertilized by sperm. In ICSI, what is happening is one sperm is being picked up, an egg is being cracked open, and that sperm is being put into the egg. You do not know that sperm is normal, like genetically normal, when you pick it up and insert it in the egg with ICSI. However, what we do know is that you're typically picking sperm that tends to be more functional. There certainly are people who have fertilization issues as their diagnosis for infertility and they don't know it. They fall into an unexplained infertility category. For me, these are people who have not ever had a positive pregnancy test. So tubes are open, you ovulate, there is sperm, but there's never been a positive pregnancy test. I'm worried that egg and sperm for some reason are not joining together and that it could be a failure of fertilization either on the sperm's end or the environment or the egg's end. This makes me choose ICSI in any cases of unexplained or of male factor because I don't wanna open up the incubator the next day and have no fertilization. However, for somebody with normal sperm parameters, a known diagnosis of tubal disease or PCOS, sometimes conventional fertilization is an appropriate option. There's normal loss in the IVF process. So you have gone through your egg retrieval and you're recovering, you're just waiting afterwards. However, what is happening is that in the lab, egg and sperm are being mixed together one way or another on day zero. The next day on day one, you're seeing how many fertilize. Typically, you're looking at fertilization rates with ICSI of about 75 to 80%. And the fertilization rates for conventional fertilization are typically around 60%. Now, part of this could be because in ICSI, you are stripping off the outer cells of the eggs and you know which ones are mature, so you're only able to do ICSI on mature eggs. And in conventional fertilization, you don't know which eggs are in the dish, if they're mature or not. You have to leave those cumulus cells on so that they can fertilize. This might give eggs more chance to mature in the dish, However, it also means some of the eggs may be really immature and it might not be a fertilization issue. It may be an egg maturity issue and you may not know that if you wind up with no fertilization the next day. After fertilization, the embryos have to grow out for five or six days until they reach what we call the blastocyst stage. This is the stage of implantation. At this stage, the embryo is like 300 cells. It is nice and expanded into this outer ball that is all we consider the trophectoderm or what will become the placenta. And then a little inner cell mass, a little group of cells on the inside that will become the baby. At this stage, embryos are very sturdy. They can be transferred into the body, put back in, they can be frozen, or they can be biopsied and then frozen. And the point of that placental biopsy is to do genetic testing of the embryo. Not every fertilized egg is going to make it to an embryo, so about 50% of the time, you will have embryos grow out from the eggs that were fertilized. So there's a lot of loss along the way. And then depending on your age, not every embryo is going to be genetically normal, even if you're young. The problem is that if you're not doing genetic testing, you don't know which embryos are normal or not. So that's a huge advantage for doing genetic testing, especially if you'd like to have more than one child, is that you really have a better idea of how many normal embryos you have, and each normal embryo is gonna give you your highest chance of pregnancy rates, which are going to be about 65% per genetically normal embryo. When you have untested embryos, your pregnancy test rates totally depend on your age, 
be it that they get much lower the older you get because the majority of your embryos are genetically abnormal, but you don't know it and you're transferring them anyway. Now, most people are freezing their embryos at this stage, and that is because either you have a lot of them, we want to decrease ovarian hyperstimulation, or we want to do genetic testing, or we want to get better synchrony between the uterine and the embryo timing. So a lot of times these embryos are getting frozen, you've had a period in the interim, then you start growing the lining, and then you do the frozen embryo transfer, or the FET. And that is the act of taking an embryo and putting it back in the body at the perfect time. Now, you also can do a fresh transfer, which is when you take one of those embryos and you put it back in the body a few days afterward. Not everybody's a candidate for a fresh transfer. If you want to do genetic testing, you're probably not going to have your results back on time. If you're trying to do fertility preservation or you might need multiple cycles to get enough normal embryos, you might not be a good candidate for this. If you're at risk for ovarian hyperstimulation, which means you have a lot of eggs and very high estrogen, then we want to make sure that we are freezing and letting your body heal before we go and get you pregnant because OHSS is worse if you get pregnant. And so that is IVF in a nutshell. If you are starting at the beginning of the suppression and you're going through suppression, stimulation, waiting on genetics, getting ready for an embryo transfer, transferring, and you have your two week wait, it's typically going to be about four months from starting the process until you get your positive test. If you're doing a fresh transfer, it could be faster. And there are a couple other variations to note real quick. One is what people sometimes consider minimal stimulation IVF. Now, this is used in marketing very often where it can be inappropriate. There are some cases where a minimal stem protocol is really appropriate, typically to try to save costs because you're not going to get many eggs. This is where you use lower doses of medication. You're only trying to get four or five or six eggs, and you might be considering doing a fresh transfer because you know you're not going to get ovarian hyperstimulation in that circumstance. There's also something called InvoCell, and often mini stem and InvoCell can now be combined. InvoCell is where the eggs and sperm are put in a little device, and then this device is put inside the vagina and held in place by a diaphragm. It actually sits there for the five days, so you incubate the embryos inside, and then the device is removed and an embryo is taken and transferred on day five, like a fresh transfer. You can't do InvoCell or you shouldn't if there's male factors or unexplained. Again, fertilization is happening not with ICSI, so you want to make sure that there's no reason to need to do ICSI and no reason to need to do genetic testing. You also can't put more than 10 eggs in the device, so it might not be good for you if you have a high egg count because you might be compromising on what your ultimate success could be. Although I think Envo can be a great option if you only want one child and you have PCOS or tubal factor and you're trying to get to IVF at a lower cost point or an easier option where an IVF clinic might be far away. This is the basic procedure of IVF from step by step. It is an overall overview. I have lots of other videos on IVF and I will be doing more of a walkthrough on the embryo transfer soon. If you have any questions, please place them in the comments so we can do an IVF and an FET Q&A coming up. As always, you can get more information on the As A Woman podcast or follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford, MD. Thanks friends.